Everyone gets a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. M.C. Sangaya is a highly respected attorney, an author, and the creator of The Portia Project, a podcast chronicling the living history of women in law. In 2017, M.C. was awarded the Ellis Medal of Honor for her professional and humanitarian contributions. I am pleased to welcome her to Bump in the Road. MC, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, first of all, so much for having me and for including me among the voices that you have on the podcast, many of whom I've I've enjoyed and been inspired by myself, so I really appreciate it. Um, My story, well, my career story is that I am a lawyer. I am an appellate lawyer. I tell stories to judges to persuade them uh, to rule for my clients And my clients are quite wide ranging, even though I'm a partner and chair of a practice group in a very large firm. I also have always been committed to pro bono work um, for the last over 25 years, uh, working on several significant cases each year on behalf of women and girls, human rights, um, Holocaust art survivor or art art heirs uh, of um, those who were persecuted during the Holocaust, um, just a whole range of things wherever it seems like, you know, the right thing needs to be done and they need some help uh, to make that happen. So that's, um, that's kind of my career in a nutshell, I suppose. Um, I originally thought that I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a poet. Um, that was when I was quite young. And then I realized that really wasn't a way to make a living or have a roof over your head. So I should rethink that. And as it turns out, the kind of lawyer I am is a writing lawyer. So it all kinds of kind of fits together in the end. On in your legal path, you made a significant pivot at one point, didn't you? Oh, I, I don't know. I think there's been a few, but <laughs> are you thinking about one in particular? <laughs> I am, but I'm going to leave the question open to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I um, I do think that, um, well, I think there were really two pivots that were the most important in my development. And I think we talked about this before in terms of growth. Um, sometimes it's foisted upon you and you have to decide whether you're, you're going to grow or shrink. So, um, so the first thing really was, deciding what kind of lawyer I really was best situated to be. Um, I did not know there was such a thing as an appellate lawyer. Um, Like I said, where we mainly write and talk to judges. Um, That really wasn't something we learned in law school. I clerked for two different appellate judges. For some reason, it just didn't click with me that this was just something that you could do uh, while I was working for them, although I enjoyed working with them and I liked that kind of work. So, Yes, the pro bono work and the service work is really intertwined with my finding my path in the law. And that was that I was a fourth year lawyer in a big firm, quite unusual to be going to trial. So I went to trial in a big criminal case and I argued motions and I wrote the jury instructions and I did all of this strategy. But I noticed that the trial lawyers really, really enjoyed cross-examining people. They just really loved, you know, essentially making people cry on the stand. And there were some unsavory characters who were witnesses and probably fully should have been allowed to cry on the stand. But I realized that I did not like that. I didn't like to hurt people. I didn't like to make people feel uncomfortable. It wasn't, you know, something I thought was like a great win to do that, no matter how much somebody, you know, might be lying or whatever. And I realized that I was a horse of a different color (laughs) than the trial lawyers. And while I could probably become, you know, pretty good at doing that, I wouldn't feel very satisfied and it wouldn't be me. 
So that was when I went, oh gosh, it's a good thing I had this trial experience so early because now I know it's really not for me, but I don't know what is. So I was kind of adrift. And about two months later, I had the opportunity to write an appellate brief on my own um, in six days in the United States Supreme Court in a case that um, was quite well covered in the media because it involved a state court judge in Tennessee whose brother was the DA and therefore was never prosecuted for any of these things until the federal government came in and prosecuted this judge for criminal civil rights violations for sexually assaulting and raping female court employees and litigants in his chambers, you know, threatening to rule against them if they didn't accede to his wishes in this small town. So he was convicted of that. And then the Court of Appeal overturned that conviction, saying that it had not been clearly established at the time that these events occurred, that this violated their constitutional rights. Now, that sounds pretty odd. I mean, that's the standard for um, for liability. But it seems odd that you think, well, this kind of seems like a pretty clear violation of bodily integrity. But there had been no case, published case precisely on that kind of conduct, hopefully, because this really doesn't happen that much. But um, but the government appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court saying, we don't think this is right. You know, we want the conviction reinstated and we think this is a bad standard. And so I was asked to support that petition with a brief. And um, I loved it. Like, I, I, in contrast to the trial, I just loved it. I really enjoyed the work. I enjoyed the strategy. I felt like I had an instinct for how to present this in a way that would help the case, even though I'd never written a brief in the U.S. Supreme Court before or any appellate brief on my own. So uh, I was really grateful to have that experience because it showed me the way of where I should be. And right after that, uh, after we got review and got the conviction reinstated, we also, um, that's when I decided to go focus on appellate law and moved to a firm that, you know, that's what they did so I could learn how to do it really well. So that's kind of the it's biggest such a pivotal point. Mm -hmm. No, that's huge. Did did that change in, per, um, in your direction set you back in terms of the partnership track for a few years? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yes, I'm, I'm sure it, I'm sure that it did, although I think not that much because I did move pretty swiftly to partner at the firm that I went to. So probably in total, maybe a year or two. But um, I think when you find what you love and what you're good at, you're going to excel and you're going to, you know, you're going to reach the partnership much, much faster, I think, than I would have, you know, where I was, where I really wasn't, I didn't like that trial work so much. No, I think that's really true. I think being true to yourself is probably one of the most important things you can do in term, particularly in terms of making these major life decisions. Yeah. I also think like trusting your gut and believing, um, you know, not ignoring that because it could be really hard in that situation. You've trained for this. You've thought, yes, I'm going to be a litigator. I'm going to be a trial lawyer. That's what I'm going to do. And then you get in that situation and you're like, not only is it that I don't think I would be as good as these other people are with it. And so it's probably not my highest and best use, but that my whole being was very different from these people. And, and so it just wasn't like, as a personality or character fit, it just, it just wasn't a fit in a very fundamental way. And to, I guess, not be afraid to admit that. I think that takes a lot of guts. Um, one of the, one of the many things you've done is you wrote a wonderful book, um, compiled a wonderful book called mother's thoughts for the day. Tell us about that a little bit and how did that influence you? Yeah. So, um, so my, mother is pretty amazing. Um, and she, uh, sent me notes really every day. Um, when I started, when I was in, started working really, but also, um, when I was in law school, because she knows pretty hard 
And um, especially at the office that I appreciated receiving these, you get all this work stuff and, you know, nasty notes from opposing counsel, but also in the mail, because we still use snail mail quite a bit then, uh, she would send me handwritten just notes, you know, that that said mother's thoughts for the day at the top. And it was just like some positive quote or some something that she thought would help, you know, me persist in whatever I was doing. And when I look back, I realized that was really important to my moving forward. Um, and so after um, a few years ago, I started thinking, well, what if, what if, um, newer professional women didn't have that, a mother that did that kind of thing, or they just didn't have that kind of continual support and, you know, go for it kind of, um, statements that maybe this would help them, would help them carry on. Um, but, and I didn't, I'll put this in the category of, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just decided, I just got this idea, like this should be a book and, you know, here's kind of what it should look like. And I've never published a book. I don't know anything about it. I don't know even know how to get it out into the world, but I'm just going to do it because I'm just going to follow my instinct that this is going to help someone. I don't even know who that someone is and I may never know. So, um, so that's what I ended up doing. I figured it out. And I think every time we do something that's different, that's outside our zone or even what we think our skills are, it always translates in some other way. Like um, I've taken creative writing classes. I think those creative writing classes have really impacted my legal writing and made my legal writing better. Doing this made me realize really from the perspective of my clients in many cases, business owners, entrepreneurs, you know, what's involved in getting something off the ground and just the kind of fortitude you have to have for that, what things you're concerned about when you're doing a business, um, just, you know, thinking about the marketing, all of that in a very different way. And then applying those new skills and kind of stacking them onto the legal skills. And I think that when you do that, it's, it's really the combination of everything together that gives you the ability to do the next thing you're supposed to do. And, and I think that's actually I know we'll talk about the, the podcast in, in a little bit, but that's definitely something that I see as a thread in the in the interviews I've done with uh, women in the Porsche Project podcast too. Yeah, talk a little bit about the podcast because it's a remarkable endeavor. Yeah, it's another one of those things that I just decided to do because I felt like the moment was right to do it and it could help people, but it's this one, it's completely exploded. And so I feel like it's meant to be in that, in that setting. So Rich, my gosh, several years ago, I started working on a book, um, interviewing women appellate judges about their history, because I had noticed that there were not that many women appellate judges around the country. At the time I started working on it, maybe 125 between state and federal. Uh, courts across the country in 50 states. And that just seemed really low to me. So I wanted to celebrate them and to encourage others to think about applying to do this. So I started working on the book. But when I was working on the book, I realized that the women judges really like to talk. They just like to get on the phone and talk with me about their stories and an oral history kind of way, which made it a little trickier to turn it into a written document and quite a bit more work on my end but also lost something in that translation than when you're having that, you can hear their, the tone of their voice and the story that they're telling. So I kind of set it aside thinking, I'm not really sure I'm capturing everything in this. And then when podcasting became more popular, I started thinking about it a little bit, but it's really the pandemic that made it crystallize both because the judges themselves were more comfortable with zoom and remote proceedings because that's how they were holding their arguments and holding court. That's really made a difference. And, um, and second of all, that I think it was the right time to tell the stories. I just feel like it was, is the right time for it to, to come out, to tell the stories of both women who were very pioneers in the profession, you know, towards um, newer attorneys who are still in, you know, pretty impressive positions in the law and outside the law. 
So I started with judges. I started with some judges I knew. Um, and I really give them a lot of credit for agreeing to do it. They had never done a podcast before. They couldn't see anything because I hadn't produced it yet. Right. So they didn't know what they're getting themselves into. And so, but they did it. Um, and so I thought maybe I'll just stop with those, you know, 15 or 20 that I approached. But the more I got into the interviews, the more they would invite somebody else. They would say, oh, judge so-and-so would be great for this. Or are you just doing judges? This other person would have a wonderful story as well. And so these sort of self-referral process through the podcast just started growing. And so I started it in February. We're at almost 40 episodes now. We did one um, that I'm really proud of that we collaborated with Girls Inc. on. And so I had a live panel of individual guests from the podcast all in front of 100 high school girls uh, who were going through this workforce training program with Girls Inc. in Orange County. And I interviewed the program chair for Girls Inc. Orange County for the podcast a couple months previous And we just really hit it off. And I said, hey, I really think we could do something because I want the podcast to reach people who aren't in law school yet and for a younger generation. And they really like podcasts, but I don't know how to break into that market. And you have that market covered, you know, and so can we interweave it with your programming? And so the two of us collaborated and decided this would be a good way to do it. They have these career panels, three or four of them in connection with this externship and workforce training program that these high school girls were in for the summer. So we had this live podcast and um, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. The women lawyers and judges who participated were very thrilled to do it. The girls who were there were happy, but usually you have these panels and it's just those hundred people who are there that can benefit from it. But by recording the podcast, it's like going to be available to anyone in high school who wants to hear that or anyone outside of high school. And then also it really opened it up to the thousands and thousands of girls, Inc. um, girls they touch in Orange County. So it was, it was really just magical. And I think that it's something we hope to, or I hope to continue to do on a local level with other Girls Inc. chapters around the country. I think um, acting as a mentor as you move along in your career is incredibly important. Did you have any mentors in your path? Yeah, I think, I think I'll have to, I'll have to say Yes, I'm sure that I did. In fact, some that I probably will never know who they were. Because I think about, I see how decisions are made now. And I think, wow, the only way something like that happens is that somebody spoke up for you in a certain room where decisions were being made. And you may never know who those people were. Um, So I, I think that's definitely true. Certainly the judges I worked for really um, mentored me and taught me how to become a good lawyer. I mean, I think law school teaches you how to think like a lawyer, where to find things, but it doesn't really train you how to be a lawyer. So, um, and that's one of the benefits of having judicial clerkships is you have the long, lifelong, you know, mentoring relationship with the judges that you worked for and they're kind of always have your back. Um, But other than that, I don't think I would differentiate between mentors and sponsors. I know people talk about mentorship a lot, but then there's also the people who stand up and go to bat for you and sponsor you for particular positions. And that that I cannot say that I have, like some people just have, oh, there was this one person throughout their career who, who did that for them. And I don't have that. I know I don't have that. But I do have this sort of perfect storm of the people when, when something was the most helpful for me to do, like it was my best way to serve. Somebody stood up to help me do that. So I think more like a variety of sponsors who kind of have moved in and out at certain points. I mean, that's, um, no, that's interesting. I think that's true for a lot of people. I was once told if they don't tell you you're doing it wrong, you're doing it. You're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was interesting. One of the judges um, who I actually worked with at one of my law firms previously that I interviewed, Judge um, Christine Bird, 
from the LA Superior Court, she had this really remarkable um, perspective, which was pretty objective, but uh, I thought well described because I've seen it in action before and I'm sure many women have too. It might resonate with them. So I wanted to bring it up. So Judge Bird said, look, women often have to make a lot of lateral moves, perhaps more lateral moves than men in their careers, because people in an organization can only see their potential for a few years in the future. For men, they can see it longer term, but for women, they just have this shorter view. And so you have to be prepared to move in order to get to a place that, you know, a man may be able to stay there for a long time to get And she even talked about it in terms of skills, like, okay, I wanted to get certain skills so that when I was up for partner in a firm, it would be no doubt, you know, that I should make partner. Like, there's no question. No one's doing me any favors. You know, I have worked hard to get the skills to do that, but I have to leave to get those skills because I'm not going to be giving them here because people are not able to see more than a couple years in advance in terms of my potential. Just thought that was a really interesting, um, you know, perspective on it, and also her attitude, rather than like being bitter or upset or saying why is that different. She just said, "Well, that's how it is, so I'm going to work within that frame, you know, to make things happen." Why do you think that is? Why do you think people tend to have a limited um, time horizon on somebody's development? Well, I, I've definitely seen that limited perspective several times with women primarily. And it's, if I put it in that, she described it that way, I put it in the category of people are more able to see the potential often in men who have skills and certain charisma, but they haven't delivered yet. Women have to have that and deliver before they're given the opportunity to deliver more. And so that's kind of the issue is that um, they can only see a few years out because they haven't seen you, you know, bring the bear to the table or whatever it is that you need to do. Whereas a guy could have like zero clients and make partner because everybody says, you know, what a charming guy and he has the right kind of attitude and he golfs with the right people or whatever it is. They can see that future in him based on his behavior. But with women, at least I've seen, it's hard to, you know, you need both. You need to have delivered so they can see that you can and then and then the other as well. It's just um, and I think the way Judge Bird described it is probably the most, you know, objective, dispassionate view of it. That calls for a lot of perseverance. What other sorts of qualities have come up across all your podcasts? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, certainly to me, it's always how in retrospect things look like it was meant to be or that's where you should have been in your in your career or that this is like your perfect sweet spot. But in fact, you only could have gotten there either because you had certain hardships and decided to grow from them or, or you went different directions in your career. And so have like layers of skill, you know, skill stacking of different kinds of things that you've done. It may seem like it's an off the beaten path move, but it, it's actually necessary. It's a necessary skill for the, for the future, but you couldn't see that at the time. So, um, yeah, so that's definitely one that you're like, oh, you know, being a certain kind of judge or being a general counsel or a law professor, um, you know, some of the law professors and deans that I've spoke to said, well, they had teaching in their family background or something like that, but they decided to go to law school and then they kind of brought that, you know, back together with law teaching. Um, Some people have... um, well, like the Girls Inc. program chair, Jessica Hubbard, she was a teacher and educator, you know, went to law school and then put her legal training and critical thinking together with her teaching experience to lead the programming for, you know, a nonprofit focused on girls. So I think that's it first is that all of these things in retrospect make, make sense, but when you're doing them, you think you're might be going the wrong direction. And then um, the second thing is that you, it's your unique set of skills that make things the right thing to do. 
You know, wisdom's always retrospective, isn't it? <laughs> it definitely is. I think um, it's, uh, you know, just like light after dark, you know, it, it, it happens, but it doesn't seem like it's going to when you're in the darkness. Now, the women you're interviewing um, are really an exceptional group. What are some of the common traits that they all share or that come up across all these different podcasts um, among these? They're all appellate, uh, appellate judges. Is that correct? No, I have. I started out with appellate judges, and then, but I also included trial judges at the state and federal level across the country. Um, but then I went beyond that. I went to sort of thinking about what are all, where are all the ways that women in the law or with law degrees or law adjacent, what have you, are, are either in positions where they can make a difference or we can show what you could do with a law degree so that if you're not sure, um, you can see, oh, it's useful for all of these things. Because we're rarely taught that in law school. We're shown on-campus interviewing, you know, either work for the government or work for a firm. Those are kind of the things that were there when I was in law school, like the easy things, maybe public interest, but none of this other stuff of opening up your mind to other things. So I have uh, one of the first, Patricia Hunt Holmes, one of the first women partners at Vincent and Elkins in Texas, who now, who previously was a PhD prior to that, and now in her third career is a legal thriller writer. So she's pretty interesting. And she introduced me to her daughter, Hillary Holmes, who is a really go-getting um, partner at a, a major firm in Texas herself. Um, so I have a mother-daughter pair um, coming up. And um, uh, those who have run nonprofits, whether we're talking about legal nonprofits um, or whether we're talking about true nonprofits. So there are uh, two people who I know who used to run legal nonprofits for uh, women and girls, and now they run museums. So to become a CEO of a museum, you know, that's not something you might think of. So I'm really opening it up to all different arenas, chief legal officers of major companies, general counsel. Um, yeah, a whole array of, of lawyers and judges. That is just, I think that's fascinating. Do you, do you run into many of those mother daughter links in your interviews? Yeah. So there's two of them thus far, as I mentioned, Patricia and Hillary. Um, there's another one that's really remarkable, which is Anna Blackburn Rigsby, who is the chief judge of the DC court of appeals. And her mother also was a judge. Her mother came to studying the law late. And so they were, I think the first mother daughter pair of judges sitting at the same time, um, you know, until recently, until her mom recently retired. But so there's an, another interesting one of um, that's, you know, notable women and mothers and daughters in the law. Yeah, I, I think people can achieve anything they set their mind to. But I think having um, a, po a, a positive parent supporting you emotionally behind the scenes is really powerful. Yeah, I'll be more, I think I'd be more specific about that. I'll, I'll say in a few of, of the cases, I know in my case and in in others certainly have an amazing mother, but also having a strong father, a father who believes and can see far ahead into your future, which most people, you know, as I mentioned, it can be hard to do <laughs> with, with uh, women and girls for some reason. When there's no limit on what they think you can do and, you know, they believe that, that the father's attitude makes a huge difference, both in terms of confidence and, you know, a willingness to just jump into the fray. I think that's definitely something I've heard and witnessed in, in connection with the podcast interviews also. Um, I think there's something also about like, determination, but I put it more in the context of um, a belief that something will happen despite all appearances that there's no way it could happen. And that is 
and a willingness to kind of just deal with the obstacles. You know, like I mentioned with with Judge Bird, she's like, well, you know, this is what I want. I'd like to be a partner in a big firm. And here, here's the path. You know, it's a different path, but I'll do it. And um, the same thing with Justice Durham, who's the, who was the former Chief Justice of the Utah Supreme Court, the first um, a woman in, in that role and one of the first women on the bench in Utah. And she was one of the ones who came out of law school and was you know, there were all these notices that said, you know, men on law review only need apply. And to see her move beyond that, find, well, where, where is the, where can I go? You know, um, where can I get hired? In many cases, in the early days, it was by the government. So there are a lot of women who were pioneering on the bench who, who were DAs, really, um, or, or some other government position, that's how they got the experience and the skills. And those are the people who are willing to go out on a limb and hire them. Some small firms and then some, you know, larger firms. But but even as Judge Bird mentioned in her interview, even in the 19, mm, early 1980s um, in Los Angeles, large firms would say, okay, we, we might, we will we'll hire you, but we're not going to hire you on a partnership track and you shouldn't expect to be here long term. You know, if you're willing to just be here for a couple of years, that's okay. Who who wants to do that? Not many people. Um, so seeing that difference in the early 80s to the early 90s when I graduated from law school, and there was nothing like that. You know, we could apply. Um, there was no question that people would be considered that, you know, on the same track and you wouldn't have to stay for two years at a big firm. I mean, it was just such a radical change in the 1980s into the 1990s that even I wasn't fully aware of at the time, like how significant that was. You know, the idea of working within the system is an interesting one. Martha McSally brought that up too. She worked within the system, within the Air Force to um, achieve her goals. And sometimes it required uh, patience, pausing, sometimes being very aggressive about things, but she was very smart about picking and choosing how to navigate that entire system. And um, I think we hear a lot of stories about, you know, the renegade, the person, the entrepreneur who just goes for things or this or that, but it's usually a lot more complex than that to navigate a career. Yeah. And also within organizations and, and I am yeah. nowhere you know, nowhere as um, adept as Martha McSally at that for sure. But um, but you have to unless you're you're doing your own thing. Although I think being a lawyer in a law firm is an interesting mix because we work within the firm in an organization, um, often in big organizations with large firms. But we are also entrepreneurial. We're responsible for our own work, um, and and that's how you make partner. If you're doing somebody else's work, um, you're not going to make partners. So there's an entrepreneurial aspect to it. There's an independent aspect to it, but then there's also within the organization. So it's kind of a combination of having both sets of skills. How important is it to bring in clients? Uh, it's kind of everything in terms of becoming partner or staying partner. It's also to me... To me, the question is always, do you want to be able to pilot your own career? Do you want to be independent, have an ability to be independent and have freedom? And the way to do that is to make the company money. And that is independent money, not just doing work on other lawyers, clients. So it's still that way. Um, some might wish that it was different, but... Um, it, it's not. So if you want to have portability and independence, you need to develop your own clients. What would you tell a young lawyer starting out to, um, how would, how should they go about, or how should she go about developing the skills to bring in clients? What's involved? Oh, I think, I think, um, the first thing is to be authentic. Cause I think that some people, think like there's a certain way to be, you know, like I mentioned, you have to go on the golf course or play tennis or do whatever it is. Um, 
that is sort of the quintessential um, business development um, way of, you know, developing clients. But I think it's important that you do whatever it is that it's genuine and authentic to you. And then you'll also attract clients who are similar to you and you'll have um, that in common as well. So I think there's no cookie cutter way. Don't try to force yourself into something that isn't you. Um, so that's my first bit of advice. The other thing is to think, not think about getting clients, but think about um, getting outside of the hallway where your office is and serving in some way. So we have bar associations, we have, you know, community boards, there's the pro bono work that I've engaged in quite a bit. All of that is a way of getting out there, meeting people, having people see your judgment and getting to know you as a person um, so that if they have a problem that might fit in your wheelhouse, you know, they will call you. And it takes years to develop this. This is the thing that constantly, um, you know, it, it, it's a problem is that um, it's often okay. You can do just great as an associate attorney, as a newer attorney, doing work, billing a lot of hours for other people. But then when it comes to partnership, you know, seven, eight, nine years out of law school, suddenly people are saying, well, where, where are your clients, you know, and you can't just develop them, you know, out of thin air and snap your fingers. And it takes years just to develop relationships with people while your competency is growing as well. You know, very few people are going to hire you to do their work two years out of law school, but you can certainly be out in the community and doing things as well as developing your skills at the same time. I think those are 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 the um, the important things that will give you opportunities. You'll learn of opportunities. You'll have the relationships in place so that when your skills are built sufficiently, you can. Um, you know, invite them to to, uh, to do some work with you or they it, it'll come to their mind because they already know and trust you. What is, um, talk a little bit about some of the pro bono work you've done. Yeah, so for me, I think my practice, particularly appellate work, is forever intertwined with pro bono work because as I mentioned with the Lanier case, um, that was my first appellate brief on my own, and I would not have gotten that opportunity if it weren't a pro bono case. Um, and so I'm indebted in part to pro bono work providing me with the opportunity to find what it is I want to do in the law. And so I just continue to, to give back in that way. So um, sorry, my dog is somebody <laughs> yeah somebody wants to go out <laughs> <laughs> she's an alarmist really so any anyone in the neighborhood on her street could be called out so yeah it's her street it's her street it's her street <laughs> yeah and she's like eight pounds um so yeah so um so for me pro bono is intertwined with the appellate practice but also, I think it's also in my upbringing that my my parents have, you know, and my uh, religious upbringing and the Catholic faith is, um, you know, you serve and you give back and as soon as you're able to. And so I think because of that, I started serving on community boards very early. I served on my first board, which was a major board, Opera Pacific, one of the largest opera companies in, in the country when I was 29. And I also worked on the linear case when I was 29. So um, I think just doing things and not thinking about your age is helpful. Also just saying, do I have something, you know, that could help and, and I'm going to, to do that. So the pro bono work I've been very consistent about, I work on, I choose two or three cases a year that I do pro bono, um, some of them through law school clinics, which are largely immigration asylum claims, um, but also cases that come to me. Because of Lanier and the success that we had so early, um, and because I was one of the only lawyers that was able to comment in the media because the government doesn't comment 
and it was a super colorful case. So I had a crash course in dealing with the media and talking about that case and the impact. And so um, from there, other cases involving women and girls, I think probably the most um, notable are some human rights cases. So there was an international human rights case against Mexico for the killings and disappearances of women and girls in Ciudad Juarez for many years, which went unprosecuted and unsolved. And uh, the court in Costa Rica um, determined that Mexico had violated the Women's Rights Treaty and the Human Rights Treaty of the Americas by allowing it to go on for so long without investigation or any effort to solve them. And so the theory, the, the legal theory is that they did not respect and ensure uh, human rights or women's rights because it was their standing back for so many years in the system that allowed it to go forward with impunity. So even though there were individual private actors who were likely doing these things, not the government, it was the government's inaction that contributed to it and allowed it to reach the level that it was at. So, so that was an amazing case to work on. It was the first case in the world interpreting a women's rights treaty. And so it's become influential in other regional um, human rights settings. And then also related to that was a case against the United States stemming from domestic violence uh order and uh, unfortunate killing of the couple's children. Um, and that had to do with the United States uh, Supreme Court said that there was no liability of the police department or the city for for those killings, even though they had refused, the police had refused to enforce a domestic violence restraining order as to which there was a mandatory arrest statute by the legislature. So it kind of fell down in the third, the third rung of the law of the law and order part. And um, because the police had done nothing at all under U S law, if you, if you're a government entity that does something poorly, you can be sued. If you don't do anything at all and you just haven't done anything, then you can't be sued under the um, civil rights statutes. So under human wow. rights law, that's not true. Um, you have this obligation to respect and ensure and to make rights practically you know, present. And so the fact that the system had said where the court issued an order the legislature said there's a mandatory arrest for a violation of that order. The police have to enforce it then. And if that doesn't happen, then you're not respecting and ensuring rights. So that decision, while not binding on the United States, has certainly been persuasive in terms of how local governments have gone forward in terms of um, implementing domestic violence laws. So, so those were two pretty interesting cases. I've also worked on a slew of, of Holocaust art recovery cases at the U.S. Supreme Court and also the state Supreme Court um, on behalf of claimants, as I mentioned. And um, that's, that's a fascinating sort of little vertical uh, in terms of, of law. Um, were these um, artworks um, and things family heirlooms, generally speaking? Were they acquired yeah, I mean, there, you know, when when you have these kind of high level, long running um, conflicts about paintings, uh, they're generally quite valuable. Mm -hmm. So um, one of them that's ongoing involves a Pizarro painting. Um, I had a case, a cert petition in the U.S. Supreme Court a couple of years ago involving a quite well known Picasso painting that still resides at the Met. Um, and uh, also, I think most famous is the Woman in Gold case, the, the movie with Helen Mirren and Ryan Reynolds, the Maria Altman case involving a series of Klimt paintings um, that uh, my friend Randy Schoenberg brought and argued and won. Um, and that was my first entree. Randy brought, brought me in to, to consult on that um, case a little bit. And then after that, I ended up doing um, quite a few of them. 
These cases are certainly about money, but I think they're also about emotion, don't you? Um, usually, isn't there a pretty strong emotional attachment to the art piece as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it's emotional and it's um, it's about claiming also, claiming things back. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, they tend to be um, some of the last things that you claim, either because you can't find them <laughs> or because you're you're fleeing, let's say you're fleeing the Nazis. And so the first thing is you're like, is my family all here? You know, do I have who I have the safety and food and shelter and all of the basic things of, of moving life forward. And there may be property or money or things like that, that you would try to get back. But it's really like, once you have all of that, then is when you start saying, yeah, whatever happened to my Monet or Pizarro or Picasso now that I'm sort of centered enough. And so I think that's why you see a lot of the art um, challenges in the Holocaust context to becoming a little bit later than, than other claims. And each country set up its own kind of claims a procedure. And so some things could be claimed and other things couldn't. Um, it wasn't like the, the allies set up a, an international procedure for the return of the paintings, even though the United States um, largely was responsible for finding a lot of them and, um, you know, bringing them uh, back to their respective countries. But the U.S. didn't want to be in the position of choosing, you know, where they should go specifically and let each country decide for itself how it would do that. Um, but the reason also there's so much art involved in this is that um, the significant amount of art holdings that moved during, during um, the war and that was because it was really part of the plan. It wasn't just collateral. Um, Hitler wanted to create a museum that had his kind of art that he elevated, um, you know, very traditional Germanic art, while basically taking out of circulation the Picassos, the Impressionists, anything that was a little bit avant-garde, that wasn't something he wanted to elevate, but he knew that other people valued it. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.